conquer aging or die trying. Most people want to talk about the first one, but I want to talk about the second part of that sentence here. So you can interpret it in two ways. One is that you died trying to conquer aging. You died and failed. But the other is that you died because you tried, because you tried so hard. So what do you mean by that? So it's the first. I don't think it's the, I, I'm trying my best to avoid the second. So uh, I can't stand the idea of aging. I can't stand the idea of functional decline uh, and everything that goes with it, increased disease risk, increased mortality rate at, for every year that we live uh, past a certain age. Um, so I'm trying to do everything I can, you know, uh, everything in the scientific literature to my own biohacking pursuits, tracking the correlations where if I do die and I say, if, because just because everyone that's ever lived has died, doesn't mean it will always be like that. Eventually the knowledge of what we know in terms of aging, there is some, there is some slope to that, right? Are we down here where it's flat? We know basically nothing. We're just primitive monkeys in the jungle, throwing rocks and stuff, hoping that it works. Maybe. But the rate of aging is a constant. So how close are we to matching those slopes, right? Uh, I, I don't know how close. Um, and the way I look at it is, is kind of like the 300 Spartan view. I, I'm going to die trying, uh, doing everything I physically can, um, as much brain capacity that I have, bandwidth, uh, to try to not die, right? So now, the other side of that equation is, what interventions are you doing? and are you doing no harm and actually improving the cause or getting yourself closer to death because you're trying, you know, things that are, haven't been approved, FDA approved, or there just isn't scientific literature on it. And you're just taking a leap. So I try to minimize that risk by focusing almost exclusively on diet and supplements and other prescriptions with a demonstrated need. So I think that's the lowest risk approach. Whereas others are taking 100 supplements, 150 supplements, trying all kinds of crazy stuff. And I say crazy, but maybe it's not crazy. Maybe I'm just behind the time. So to me, that would minimize my risk of this. I died trying because of what I was doing versus I died trying where I took the lowest risk approach that should have given me the most, the most gains. You know, I'm sure you know, just as one last point, there's a guy named uh, Aaron Trawick who was in this space kind of, but he was in more of the biohacker side and not maybe necessarily understanding the science of it as much. So whether he overdosed on ketamine in a float tank or was trying some kind of intervention aimed to improve, the, improve his health, uh, he died in his 20s. So I'm trying to avoid that fate with everything that I do. You know, there was, there was a famous bodybuilder, I don't remember who, who was training other bodybuilders later on. And he told to one of his trainees, his bodybuilder, that if you want to be Mr. Olympia, don't ask me to cite anything. Like, that's not how people become Mr. Olympia, right? Like, there is a huge amount of bro science out there, and they have to, well, die trying. Anyway. Um, Along those lines, so... There is no one size fits all prescription, right? And what works in the published literature doesn't necessarily work at the individual level. So you may have a randomized control trial of 50, 100, pick your sample size. You know, the larger the sample size, the closer you would expect to be representative of a population-based average that should work for most people. But the fact is, and this is where I see the frontier of individualized precision, nutrition, precision, medicine is, does what works for other people work for me? And if not, what will work for me? So the idea of the bodybuilder saying, don't ask me to cite anything, that kind of goes to that to this point. What is the individual prescription? What works for you may not work for me. If beta carotene is associated with higher albumin for you, for, I work with clients who it's the opposite in their data. Their correlations are actually the opposite. So I don't try to push anyone towards uh, my diet or my supplements or lack of supplements. I work with people who have a completely different diet, who try to supplement the heck out of everything. Um, you know, it's all about following the data though. You know, what do your biomarkers say? What can we do to improve specific biomarkers and, you know, biomarkers of organ and systemic function? Uh, and it's personalized, right? But it takes a lot of data to get to that point. You know, someone's got to be willing to test 
you know, six, seven, eight times per year, over and over year after year, um, in order to see what do the correlations show, right? Michael is garden. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I have been very excited to, to host you. In fact, I have been probably the most excited to host you because what you're doing is what Brian Johnson aspires to do, right? Like follow the data, DDD, data-driven development. Every calorie must fight for his life. And you're doing that and your data is actually out there and you're showing people how you're deriving your conclusion. I would like to go on a little bit of methodological philosophy and, and then I will give back the word to you because what, what this is going to be about, at least in the beginning, is about your methodology because that is unique, that is something that very few people are willing to do, and even if they are willing to do, they still cannot. So I want to talk about mathematics, uh, physics, biology, and economics. In mathematics, we have some axioms, and based on those axioms, we can derive a lot of things those are applicable to reality. Now, in physics, we now have the ability to to actually test stuff and then we start testing stuff with the scientific method and we get to the conclusion based on our repeated tests. When we are starting to go to biology, we are we're still doing that. We are still testing stuff, but we are starting to have problems with the causation there because because causation doesn't even exist, but uh, that's a that's a that's a completely <laughs> that's that's another philosophical uh, musing there. But in biology, not everything happens all the time how it's being tested. And when we even move to move on to economics, then we are starting to realize that. Well, you cannot have experiments. These are N of one experiments. These big things in economics happens only once. And then what people have figured, the Austrian economics have figured is that, well, let's just take the, the grand truth of economic, that grand truths of economics, supply them and, and build an axiomatic systems out of that. And now we are back to mathematics. So. Where you lie on that spectrum is, is, is somewhere you're, you are an N of one experiment and, and a very rigorous, rigorous one of that. So, 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 so what, what you're doing, as far as I understand, is that you take note of everything that you're doing in your life, what you're eating, what you're, your your workout when you're sleeping everything and then you're trying to find correlations in between between these actions and based on that correlation you're building your learnings so just to contrast that to let's say dave pasco who is more like the fuck around and find out guy well, I don't have a question there, but I think you have a lot of thoughts based on what I just said. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know. I don't know that Dave is so much in the uh, F around find out uh, camp, even though he takes a lot of supplements. Um, I think he, I think he's, so first of all, he lives life. Like he travels all over the world and, and does all kinds of quote unquote fun stuff. And I put that in quotes because I'm a different kind of guy. I think I'm, <laughs> oh God, with the, without trying to sound egotistical, I'm happy to be like a Nikola Tesla and just be in isolation for most of my life, working at the science of this. And if that means I've sacrificed the social aspect of it, when considering I was never socially, you know, uh, popular, you know, amongst the masses, I'm okay with that. So but he lives life and I appreciate him and that mindset. But I think, I think he's gotten to the point where he's played around with his own data for so long that 
it's um, seeing what sticks and keeping keeping it there and and throwing out what what might not. Now, is there a lot of noise in there? Like because 150 supplements, there's got to be some noise. Same, and the same thing could be true for Brian, who's taking about 100 supplements. You know, I, I don't know, but um, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put him in the f around find out boat in terms of uh, in terms of his data, right? So so yes, yeah, so we got a lot of things to touch on. So one, yes, I put all of my data out there. Not all of it. I mean, I've got the raw data on my side, but you know, I've got correlations with lots of stuff on Patreon. I post a lot of that on YouTube, and I did that, and I, and I will continue to do that uh, on purpose because you know, Brian's got a team of of at least an MD. I don't know what other scientists he has on his team, but I'm sure that he can communicate with anybody that he wants to who's got uh, you know credentials and education in this field. So he's got a. I'm sure he's got a pretty smart team, but. I think I think limiting yourself to only a few people, and, and that's great for him. I'm not trying to knock his approach. I think limiting yourself to only a few people, insight is a, you know, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I may know what I know. I may have a lot of knowledge in what I know, but I don't pretend to know everything. And I think great ideas can come from anywhere, from PhDs, from high school educated, high school dropouts, whomever, man, woman, pick, pick, your, pick your, you know. So I, in the beginning, it was like, I'm going to put this out there and there may be areas I'm deficient in. Let's see, right? So I've gotten plenty of comments. I try to read every comment on YouTube. I post everywhere, Reddit, uh, X, LinkedIn. I'm posting everywhere. I'm looking at comments from everywhere, you know, good, bad, and the ugly. Can I get more insight beyond what I already know? And in many cases, that's true. So it's, uh, it, for me, I see it as an open source kind of thing where, you know, I'm potentially helping the community. And they're potentially helping me. Now, maybe it's not a fair trade. Maybe I'm helping more than they're helping me. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I see it as an equal, an equal partnership. So, okay. Then also in terms of uh, statistical rigor, right? So proving causa causation, which as you know, has, is a whole nother can of worms in itself. I generally don't go after this is what caused this. And the reason I say that, especially when you're looking at a uh, hundred different variables for each biomarker. And now if I'm looking at 30 biomarkers, you know, you do 100 times 30, you've got 3,000 comparisons, right? With a false discovery rate of just 0 0.05, there's going to be a lot of false positives in that data set. I don't know which ones are false positives. So if I impose an FDR, you know, an extra level of statistical rigor on just beyond the unadjusted correlations, I'm potentially throwing out important correlations that I wouldn't know. And then I may only follow those correlations that are significant at a certain threshold, but I may be missing most of the other story. So for now, I've used the unadjusted correlation-based approach. If I have 10 nominally, you know, p-value less than 0 0.05, for example, 10 or 15 or 20, whatever it is, significant correlations with a given biomarker, and then a subset of that are significantly correlated across the net of 30 or so biomarkers, I'll follow those correlations. So for each test, I may have four or five different interventions that I'm doing at once. Now, for, mo for most people who are classically trained in science, they'll say, that's stupid. You need to do one intervention at a time and do that 10 times and then take the intervention away and then see if you get a result. But how am I going to generate 20 blood tests? How will my arms, how will my veins look? You know, I'll be like a heroin addict every, I, I don't want to do that. I I'm not trying to, right? So I've, I've found that the correlation-based approach over a long period of time, as I've been doing this since 2015, I've got now 50 plus blood tests and following the, the correlations at the top of the heap and then trying those interventions. Okay, I've got these five foods and nutrients that suggest higher this. Okay, let's try it. Next blood test comes around. I recalculate the data. If they were true or involved in that story, their correlation should stay relatively strong. If they were not a part of that story, their correlation will weaken, other stuff will pop up. And I continue to iterate that process over and over and over until I get to the point where I'm like, okay, here is the foundation of my macros, my micros, um, fiber intake. Now here are some weak spots. What can I do without blowing up the full system because that seems to push everything towards youth and lower all cause mortality risk. What can I do to optimize some of these weak spots without blowing up the full core? So that's where I am now with that approach as, you know, I've optimized a lot of stuff towards youth, at least right now, but I do have weak spots. So in terms of people tracking, right? So 
that market has exploded over the past 10 or so years, right? You've got people wearing fitness trackers. You've got people tracking their diet, which is a market size of about 20 million people. You've got people tracking sleep. The problem now is it's not generally integrated across measures. Like you do have some companies, uh, fitness, you know, the, you know, you'll have blood testing companies that'll link with the fitness tracking stuff, but, um, you know, and then even the recommend recommendations that they make aren't generally very good. So I'm actually in development, uh, uh, with an app right now to, um, basically bring my simple correlations based approach to the masses. So anybody that's tracking diet and has a few blood tests, they can start to look at their own correlations, um, which saves an, an immense amount of time. It's like seven to 10 hours of work every time I get a blood test. So we'll be able to get that data within, you know, minutes. So I'm working on building towards those tools where people can do it much faster um, and analyze their own data or come to me if they want some help. Are you developing the app what, in what language? Uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a developer. I don't have the coding tools like you and, and your community. I'm, I say it all the time. I'm coding stupid. I've tried to learn R and my brain is just not structured or hasn't been up until this point. I don't know what language that they're using. Uh, I, I can I can find out. We've got two developers that are uh, that are uh, kick ass. Or my limited ability to, you know, I'm not a coder, so I can't really comment on how good or not they are, right? But from my limited perspective, they're kick ass coders. But I'll find out what language that they're coding in. You see, don't don't think so low of yourself because I have met people who do not code, but they know what they want, and their code looks. They might not use the best practices, right? But their code looks something that I can understand. Yeah. And that is, that is great. That, that is all I want from a code to understand. I have an idea. Let's write some code. So the very first programming lesson that I've ever got is about um, making some coffee or tea. I don't remember which one, maybe both. And I had to write down that what I'm going to do with the tea, the first thing, and turns out that recipe is an algorithm. So what I would like you to do now is to teach me how to do your method, give me a distilled down algorithm on how to do your method. Let's assume I want to do that and and I don't want the entire stuff, but I just want the the main stuff. So what yeah. do I do? It's pretty straightforward. So um, if you have one blood test, you can't really do much with that. Um, so let's just start with weighing all of your food, right? But then even tracking your supplements, right? So for let's say that there's a 50 day period in between blood tests, day one blood test, day 50 blood test. So if you're tracking your dietary intake, if you're tracking your average daily heart rate as a measure of how physically active or how much stress that, you know, cumulative stress. If you take that 49 day average in between blood tests, that then lines up with the latter blood test. So now each blood test has a set of variables that align. So now you blood test another 50 days later. Now you have two sets of data, two 49 or 50 day groups of data that you can compare, just even using a two sample t test. And for variables that change, you can just go across the board macros, micros, supplemental intake. Uh, HRV, resting heart rate, pick your variables of, of interest to see what's different in the inputs and what's different in the outputs. And maybe there are 10 things that have a significant, nominally significant, uh, significant difference, you know, p-value less than 0 0.05. Nonetheless, there are going to be some things that are going to be different. And then you have some hypotheses. Okay, albumin went up. These things changed. Is it causative? If it's causative, if I keep them high, let's see what happens. All right, so then going from two tests, for the next 50 day period or however many days in between tests, using that same approach, for each subsequent test, you have those inputs because you're tracking them, the average intake for the full period. Now you have three tests. And even though three tests isn't a lot to look at correlations, you can still get a ballpark idea of stuff that may be related. Stuff that's completely unrelated, the correlations will be flat. Um, and there may be a lot of, there's obviously a, not a, a lot of noise in that data. But that's basically the guts of it. Tracking, lining up the blood test data with the inputs, with every, whatever you're tracking. After two tests, uh, two sample T tests, after three tests, looking at just simple correlations. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, adding another layer of statistical rigor, you know, for some things I have 2000 data points, right? Like HRV, resting heart rate. And because I've tracked body weight and a whole host of other metrics, 
um, knowing that body weight is a big, uh, strong, it's strongly correlated with both HRV and resting heart rate. If I'm looking at other factors that may be involved, I adjust my model. So I don't just look at simple correlations. I look at, um, you know, multivariate adjusted linear regression models, which sounds like a fancy thing, but it's just one step beyond the simple correlation. So that's the approach that I've used. It's uh, pretty simple, I'd say. May, may I have a quick selfish question on, on that? So I just started doing a diet uh, one week ago when it's RFL, um, high protein, high fiber, low fat, low carb. My HRV and my resting heart rate is amazing ever since. But my blood pressure went up. Like I have high blood pressure now. I don't know why. It shouldn't be the, the opposite. I'm even doing potassium, calcium, magnesium, and even salt. Like I'm doing a bunch of supplementation. So I, sh I don't think it should be that. So do you have any guesses what yeah. could happen? Well, here? so that raises an interesting point, right? If a certain diet supplement or group of supplements or even prescription meds, rapamycin, pick, pick your, you know, pick your geoprotector or senolytic of choice. If that improves one biomarker in isolation, maybe that's great. So not to, you know, poop on the keto crowd and the carnivore crowd. And I'm open to every diet, diet potentially being good for health. You just got to show me the net sum of the data. But a lot of people in that community will say, well, look at my markers of metabolic health, glucose and lipids, and then not show any other data. So can you, now maybe the other data is great and they just don't show it for whatever reason, but I try to look at the sum across a net of as many organ systems as possible. So not just blood pressure, but kidney function, liver function, inflammation, metabolic health, um, lung function, uh, you know, so like a forced expiratory volume, right? Function during workouts, right, is if, if you know your strength in a given set of movements, is your strength better, worse, or the same, right? So, so for your diet, if that's the only thing that you changed, I would take the check off the box across all of the biomarkers that you're checking. Does it seem to be a net positive? If so, uh, that's good. But then there are going to be things, like you said, your blood pressure that may not be positively in fact, uh, uh, impacted and in fact going in the other direction. So then the question is, what can you do within your current diet? to positively impact blood pressure while still keeping the positive changes on everything else, right? So, and I don't know what the answer is there. That takes a lot more tracking. Okay, okay, no, 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 that's, that's interesting. It didn't even occur to me to try to somehow actually combat my blood pressure. A quick, a quick analogy along that, like, so one of my weak points is homocysteine, right? So homocysteine increases during aging. It's basically a marker of hypomethylation. Um, it's related to blood pressure and dementia risk all cause mortality. So my values have been close to age expected for a few years, probably for, I think, 20 tests in a row, age expected data. I've tried every methyl donor you can think of. I don't have genetic uh, methylation issues, at least based on SNPs. I've had values half of where they are now about 20 years ago. So I've had this age-related increase, even though I've had a lot of positive impact, impacts on other biomarkers. I've tried, you know, the folate methyl B6, trimethylglycine. I've tried serine plus B6. Every biochemical pathway that's been linked with homocysteine, right? So only recently I was able to make a dent. Now, whether I can repeat that, I don't know. But again, I'm not trying to blow up the rest of the system. I'm trying to make small changes to improve these weak spots while keeping everything else. So one of those changes from my latest test was cutting mushroom intake. So mushrooms, as I'm sure you know, Spermidine increases lifespan in animal models. Ergothionine increases a lifespan in animal models and is related to neurodegeneration when its levels are low. Potentially important metabolite, but that's a story for another day. So mushrooms, fiber, niacin, mushrooms are an all-star. So I've been eating about 250 grams on average per day for probably about three years, which seems like a lot, but who knows how much is too much or what is the dose, right? What dose is optimal for just food, right? So mushrooms have niacin. Niacin comes in two main forms, nicotinamide and nicotinic acid. So I've had problems with NAD being relatively low and also age expected or worse. But yet my niacin intake is two and a half times the RDA. So how do you square that circle? How can I have two and a half times the RDA for a nutrient that's known to increase NAD. How does that make sense? So I know that nicotinic acid in my case raises NAD, even very low dose. So then that argues that mushrooms may not contain nicotinic acid. They may contain nicotinamide, 
Now, the reason why that's important is, is because nicotinamide raises homocysteine more than nicotinic acid. That's been shown in at least one randomized controlled trial. All right, so then I've got the hypothesis. If that's true, and I cut mushroom intake down, not eliminate it because I still want some ergothionine and spermine and fiber and everything else, magnesium, all of the other great things it has. If I cut it down, will I see a change on homocysteine? And if so, that even just 10 milligram per day change um, of nicotinamide may have been causing higher homocysteine. Well, my homocysteine went from an average of about 10 micromolar for 20 consecutive tests to a value that I've only seen with high dose B12 by cutting, so, so nine micromolar. Not a big difference, but it's my lowest value of 20 tests. Whether that's mushrooms, I don't know. I'm going to keep mushrooms down from 250 to about 95 grams per day. All of the other biomarkers didn't change for now. I don't know about epigenetics or uh, Dunedin pace, telomere length. I don't know what happened there, but the phenoage and albumin and glucose inflammation, none of those went in crazy directions. So I basically kept the core and potentially improved one biomarker without blowing up the system. So, so I... So that going back to your data, it's a matter of finding which aspects of your diet could be causing the blood pressure increase. And I don't know what it could be. That's something you'd have to track and look at correlations over time. Okay. Uh, by the way, that's a beautiful story. Um, it's, um, well, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to figure things like that out. And you're not going to get things from, from, from research. <laughs> um, it, in fact, in fact, when I first started on this journey, it was, what does the published data say? Let me try it. And I had incredible hope that these things that have been published to work in other people would work in me. For example, my liver enzymes, uh, which just using the reference range, not even focusing on what's optimal in terms of risk of death for all causes, which I find more valuable. Uh, the reference range generally for liver enzymes, AST, ALT is zero to four. For a period in the beginning, I had liver enzymes for both AST, ALT that were 36, 37, 38, and above 40. Now, I'm not an alcohol drinker. I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but it's almost never for the past 15 years. So that wasn't it because um, alcohol is well known to you know, induce, liver, uh, induce liver damage, high levels of liver enzymes. All right, so then you've got milk thistle, right? This is the pop culture and there is some published evidence for it, right? Okay, let's try it. Didn't do a thing. High fructose. Fructose is known to uh, damage the liver as it's metabolized in the liver. My diet had about twice as much fructose as it does now. I cut the fructose intake. It didn't do a thing. Green tea, high dose uh, EGCG, which is found in green tea, has been shown at least supplemental form. Uh, but I was drinking probably uh, four times as much green tea then as now. So I tried cutting my green tea intake. Didn't make a dent on the liver enzyme. So uh, there are a lot of people who are using published studies and then doing a given intervention or, or trying something saying, oh, it worked there, I'm good, it worked there, I'm good there, and not actually testing. That's the one thing that I stress without bias is test. We need to test. We don't need to rely, rely on studies and other people. We need to test ourselves. We need to test ourselves all, often. And it's only through that approach that we can get closer to what the truth, you know, the, uh, the, the recipe, the, 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 the driver's manual for optimal operation of our machine. You know, I created two challenges for you, but you've already overcome the first one without me even saying it. So let's just move on to the second. You're eating in a way that every calorie must fight for its life, but you're trying to do this with whole foods, even though the logical conclusion, if you would really take that goal to its extent would be that you should try to do it with the most isolated supplements because well that has the least amount of calorie and you're not going to get uh, get saturated fat in let's say uh, selenium supplements instead of um, what's that nut brazilian nut right so what do you say to that yeah so there are two things there one is i prefer targeted supplementation with a demonstrated need, which is basically a, a medicine mindset, right? You have a given disease, you have high blood pressure, we're going to give you a diuretic, right? You have demonstrated problem, what's the, what's the best solution? So I'm not completely opposed to supplements. So I have experimented, you know, with, as I mentioned, high dose, higher dose, folate, B12, B6. Uh, I took five grams of supplemental BCAAs to test homocysteine. I do things 
with demonstrated need that are up to a point resistant by diet, right? Just as another example. Um, so for whatever reason, or maybe it's because I took antibiotics like candy, candy pills as a kid. So my mom, I, you know, I'd, I was sick as a kid for whatever reason. You know, my mom went to the doctor, got me some penicillin. Penicillin bottle went on, went on the shelf. When I was in a relatively young age, I learned how to unscrew that screw top, which is supposed to be resistant to children. And, and I was like, I don't feel well today. I'm going to take some pe penicillin. I don't know if that's the reason for it, but I've got um, relatively elevated Candida IgG antibodies that go back to 2017. So in 2017, I forgot about it. I thought, oh, whatever, who cares? It doesn't matter. But I started testing that more often uh, in 2024, four tests so far. And each test has been higher than, than it should be. It's outside of the range. So what's causing that, right? So I tried to look at correlations over four tests. And the long story short is, uh, <laughs> you know, the F round find out is one side of the story. The died trying because maybe I wasn't open to, you know, for example, if I have cancer, am I going to say, hey, I'm going to track correlations with diet for 20 tests over the next three years and see if I can beat cancer? Or am I going to do chemo and everything else in the rapid short term, right? So there's a balance there between I need to fix these things ASAP. All right. So candida is something I want to fix ASAP. I'm, I don't want to F around and find out anymore. This has been at least a problem since 2017. It could be something that goes back 30 years. So I, uh, Worked with a doctor yesterday and rapamycin's on the way. I'm going to do that experiment. So now we've got, what does rapamycin do to my data? And because I've got 50 plus blood tests, I'll be able to see if it does something to candida as it's a known antifungal. It's known to eliminate candida, uh, at least in vitro. Uh, RCTs are limited. But, um, you know, so I'm not opposed to the supplements and, and GIRA protectors. It's just demonstrated need and things that are resistant by diet. Now, to add one last bit to that story, it, you know, it goes to the lowest risk. If it, yes, every calorie is fighting for its life in my approach, but that, that, that mindset also suggests some amount of, um, you know, my diet sucks. I'm not happy with it. You know, I have to, you know, so, so it, that's not it at all. I, all of the foods in my current approach have come there by, you know, trial and error but also because I like them and I feel satiated almost exclusively on this approach. Could I eat pizza and ice cream? For sure. And after a blood test, I do eat some of that junk. And it's interesting, like I generally don't have problems with uh, satiety where I'm like, God, I got to eat ravenously like that. I haven't had that issue, fortunately, knock on wood for a few years. But on the days when I have cheat meals immediately after a blood test, when my fiber intake is at least half of what it generally is, I really have to use some willpower to say, all right, don't overeat today. And, and I think fiber and, and, and the approach is a big part of that. So uh, anyway, going back to the point of each calorie fighting for its life and why not, why not just supplementing with it? There's something about food matrix. Now, whether that actually is involved in optimal health, I don't know. But I, I just think getting it from whole foods, trying to get it as much from whole foods as possible, whereas taking all of it via supplement, I think the whole food based approach is the lowest risk based approach. You know, so polypharmacy in older adults is not generally associated with better health. Now, granted, polypharmacy being they're taking numerous amounts of medications for various health related conditions. So, is it so different where you've got someone who's generally healthy and they're taking 100 supplements? Fast forward 50 years, now they're generally older, taking 100 supplements. Are those supplements now? good within the context of aging or, you know, how, what is the net effect, right? So I try to limit as much supplements as possible, trying to get the diet to optimize it as much as I can with the thinking that that's the lowest risk-based approach. But even on a whole food-based diet, you know, I guess, I don't know if uh, Steve Jobs was a fruititarian, you know, for most of his life or just did that once he was diagnosed with cancer. But, you know, even on a whole food based diet, it may not be optimal. Like, what is an optimal diet? You know, so another thing, <laughs> I have another thought here, right? For the longest time, the idea was eat real food and exercise. And forever I've thought that that's just not good enough. What is the evolution of that approach? So, within a whole food based approach, how much protein, how much fat, what micros, micronutrients, right? So, and then how do you even address those questions, right? So, I try to get closer to that with whole foods still thinking that that will be the lowest risk-based approach. Uh, but even on a whole food-based approach, it can be negative if you go too far in one direction or, you know, or, or the other. Um, let's take a person 
a normal person, right? He is not taking supplements and not eating healthy. Okay, now let's give that normal person some supplements, some 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 vitamin, multivitamin, fish oil, and and vitamin D. That's enough. So that person, that normal person, is healthier. Would you agree? That normal person is healthier than the one who wouldn't take any anything. Yeah, maybe not. And then I'd say I'd have to see the data. But in terms of the foundations of health, I think the foundations are what what you hear everybody say, and it's cliche, but it's pretty much true. Uh, sleep quality and duration, short sleep being bad, very good, very long sleep also being potentially bad. Um, short, short sleep can impact things like metabolic health and glucose levels. So if someone's not paying attention to sleep quality and duration, things like slow wave sleep, which decline during aging or the percentage of slow wave sleep, which decline during aging, and that's involved in dementia risk. So sleep is a humongous part of this approach. So if the person who's just taking some supplements, does it improve sleep? The other side of it is regular exercise. You know, now even there it comes to prescription, how often, at what intensity, for how long? Um, because exercise is a stressor. If you're running, if you're not conditioned to it and you run a marathon, you'll feel terrible for a pretty long time after you ran that marathon, right? Like David Goggins talked about how he had bones broken in his foot or something like that. And he ran like a hundred miles or did some ultra marathon, right? So exercise is a stressor. The question is frequency, dose, intensity. So getting that, getting those right beyond just exercise a certain amount every week is a big part of the approach. But then even when it comes to diet, diet is another foundation, you know, like, as I mentioned, you know, uh, macros and micros and how many calories, right? Calorie restriction, even, I don't, I don't think we have to go to 25, 30, 40%, like the animal models to get big increases in, in health or lifespan uh, in terms of CR. In my case, it's like a mild restriction over a long period of time where the net effect on the biomarkers is like 10 biomarkers out of about 30 going in the right direction versus wrong in terms of how they should look in terms of aging or all-cause mortality risk. So leanness, whether it, in part by mild to moderate CR in conjunction with regular exercise training year over year, week to week, you know, for a long period of time. Um, so for me, these are the foundation. Now, how much will supplements add to that? I don't know, but I'd bet that someone that's lean has very little level, low, uh, low levels of visceral fat, who's highly functional, doesn't have to be a VO2 max of 60. It could be something lower than that, but above average fitness and consistently gets good sleep quality and duration where you're avoiding that age-related decline for slow wave sleep. I bet that that's at least a 20-year gain um, in average lifespan. Now, does that get you to 120 and beyond? Who knows? Will adding supplements and rapamycin and geoprotector senolytics on top of that add to it? That's where we have to get into the testing, you know. So, you know, for example, if my albumin is what you'd expect to find in a 20-year-old, five, or glucose is in the 80s, which is what you'd expect to find in a 20-year-old, CRP is below the li limit of detection, HS, CRP, below the limit of detection. If I'm taking rapamycin and I've already got the majority of my biomarkers are youthful, how's it going to impact my lifespan further? Now, if it impacts things that like, candida, which could potentially shorten lifespan or other uh, microbes that may be uh, accumulating that I don't know of, okay, maybe that's a benefit. But I prefer to see the quantified approach to someone's got the foundation down, they're taking a given supplement or drug or prescription, whatever it may be, and now they see a further improvement in certain metrics. Okay, I'm with that. But for the generally healthy person who has not optimized the foundation or isn't trying to optimize diet, exercise, sleep, I don't know how much it helps. In fact, maybe it could be even detrimental because maybe they're mega dosing stuff that they wouldn't ordinarily see on a normal diet. Maybe it's not in the in the format that you would get from food. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know, because some of these things are not in the same, maybe you get a form of B12 in a supplement that you're not getting in food, right? And then you've got the food matrix, which helps with absorption and other stuff, right? So I can't say with any certitude that someone taking the supplements in general without the foundation would be good good or good for health okay well, well, well that's where i was going with it so okay first of all i would like to just note that that getting my grandma to take a pill every day will will cost her i can't do that by the way i can't get her but 
it would be infinitely easier than getting her to exercise or sleep well or yeah. eat well, right? So anyway, so we have the person who's not doing anything. We have the person who's taking some basic supplements and you're saying that, well, we are not quite sure if it's making any difference. But there is a third person here who is taking supplements based on data. So we don't really have those kind of people who are like rigorously measuring, but having bad sleep, bad exercise, bad everything, but taking the right amount of supplements to get, how did you say, optimize yourself into the, into the optimal range, something, something like that. So that's, that's, that's an idea for a supplement company, right? Um, and, and then, and then the question is, what's the, what's the test? So let's build a supplement company. Uh, what's, what's the test here? You can have regular blood test, which is quiet, problematic. That's a very bad user experience. You know, you have to go to a doctor and maybe in the U S it's easier, but in Hungary, um, the. The, the, the medical bureaucracy is impossible to navigate, even if you just want to get a single blood test. So, but there is something else called epigenetic tests, which are also trying to tell you, they can tell you the same things what a blood test can tell you. And that's just, uh, uh, I'm getting there. Don't worry. <laughs> I, got I, I know I'm that you've done, them. you've done, you've tested them. So I, I want to ask about that, but, uh, you know, they don't even claim because I've talked with Brian, uh, Ryan, uh, CEO of TrueDiag, that they are not allowed to legally tell you a bunch of things that they probably know because then they would be medical services and uh, whatnot, bureaucracy, uh, government encroachment on people, uh, usual story. The, the point is that they, in theory, would be able to tell you stuff. And now the question is how accurate those things are, right? And you've done those tests and I've heard you say that, well, I've done those tests the same day and then they didn't really correspond, but, um, there is an argument, there is an argument there. And I would like to ask you about this argument. So I've heard the true diagnostic people saying that it is possible. They're not claiming that, but it is possible that the epigenetic tests are better than the blood tests because what the blood tests are showing you is more, more fluctuating day to day, but what the epigenetic fingerprints are telling you is on a longer time frame. What was your experience in, in, in this? All right. So we got two thoughts here that I want to address. The first is, um, so my niche generally, everybody has a niche, right? I wish I could, I could, uh, have, you know, I don't know. 300 million followers on Instagram or whatever it may be, because the masses all know about, right? 300 million people know and appreciate and love what I do. That's not the case. My niche is, um, and people with, that I work with is they're highly motivated. They're willing to track, they're willing to blood test. And this generally is not the average population, right? This is, a, I don't want to say the far right side of the, uh, the normal distribution, but these are the high, high motivated, highly motivated people, CEOs, execs, et cetera. Now, can I, can I convince people who are above average intelligence to get closer to the far right side of the normal distribution? Maybe. Can I convince the average person off the street who doesn't care anything about diet or exercise or sleep to optimize their health? Generally not. Uh, that's a very difficult, uh, and there are plenty of other people in this space who are, who, who that's their niche, right? So, and that's okay. That's just, you know, what can you do, right? So, and it's like that in any business, you know, you have people who politically lean a certain way, you have people who diet, lean a certain way. My niche is my niche. Okay, now, second is, um, and I'm okay with that. It is what it is. That said, going back to the grandma who maybe she doesn't exercise or eat well um, or sleep well, I do think it is possible and obviously conventional medicine could attest to that, right? You have high blood pressure, you take a diuretic, blood pressure goes down. There are certain things that do work for, you know, isolated situations in terms of improving health related outcomes. Um, now with the mindset of longevity, does that, does that translate, right? So I, I'd say 
Uh, it could, right? So for example, the stomach produces less acid during aging. And as a part of that process is acid is required to uh, have protein digest protein digestive enzymes to have maximal activity. So protein digestive enzyme activity uh, output declines during aging too, in part because of the decrease in stomach acid output. Another aspect of aging that may be related to that is poor kidney function. Because if you're not digesting protein when it's in the stomach and absorbing it into the intestine, more of it may make it to the large intestine where it's fermented by gut bacteria into potentially del deleterious metabolites that negatively impact kidney function. Now, that happens during aging. These metabolites increase during aging. Is it because older people are eating more protein? Generally not. They're not eating more protein. But to me, it makes sense that older people may have a problem with acid secretion by the stomach and protein digestion with more of it, more of it being fermented by gut, bac gut bacteria. Now, that's a relatively easy fix. People could take, in, those, in that situation, you know, there are acid supplements like betaine, HCL, and others, which can lead to an increase in stomach acidity at least within an hour, at least based on published studies. So someone's eating a high meat diet and they know they have problems with kidney function, maybe taking some acid supplements in, co in conjunction with uh, protein digestive enzymes, whether it's pepsin or trypsin or whatever they can find, that could potentially limit how much protein goes to the large intestine, more of it absorbed into the blood, could potentially impact muscle mass because now you're actually using it for what it can you know, be used for. You have less of these protein or amino acids in the gut where they're not going to be fermented into metabolites by bacteria that can negatively impact the kidney. So now you've got a feed forward positive loop just based on one or two supplements and a targeted demonstrated need, knowing that there's decreased kidney function during aging, there's decreased stomach acidity during aging and decreased uh, uh, protein digestive enzyme output during aging. So but in that situation, I'd have to see your grandma's kidney function and other biomarkers related to that and her protein intake to see if she'd be a good candidate for that demonstrated need. To just take those supplements because you're a certain age, maybe your kidney function is good and you're taking these supplements. You don't need it. It's just wasted energy and, and money, right? So, and I think a lot of people are in that situation where they take supplements and don't have any data and it's just basically hope. You know, it's, uh, I think it's going to work because it worked in animals. I don't have any of my own data. I'm good. But I think that's a flawed approach and potentially dangerous. So that was the beginning of the, the, the grandma story. Ah, epigenetics. So I'm a big fan of Ryan and, and uh, Hannah and True Diagnostic. Big fan. You'll never hear me say a bad word about them. They are fantastic. And I don't throw around superlatives easily. Um, they're fantastic. So uh, in t this, I don't see this as an epigenetics versus standard blood test uh, battle, right? So there's a, I see it as a hierarchy, right? So at the top of the hierarchy is phys physical, cognitive, emotional, health, and function. Now, as a part of that story is uh, body composition, right? So percent body mass, percent fat mass, visceral fat mass, bone density. These are the top of the pyramid. We want to have optimal levels of all of those. And if there's any decrement in any of those things over time, which are well known to happen, more body fat, more visceral fat, less bone density, et cetera, something's wrong. And because we can potentially intervene there. But what's under the hood? And I think most people stop there, right? They look at the scale or, or you know, they go to the gym. But the fact is most 70-year-olds, even the most highly motivated people, maybe 70s and early age, most 85-year-olds compared to where they were in their 20s, less muscle mass, less function, et cetera, right? So, but what's underlying that, right? So if you dig under the hood, which is what I'm trying to do, we can take it a step, step by step. You've got cells, proteins and metabolites, epigenetics, and then DNA. Now we can't control our DNA, right? That's just the script for what can happen, right? And even if you've got uh, a genetic risk for certain you know, uh, outcomes, you know, based on a few thousand SNPs all working together, it's still a risk, it's still a potential. You would need that script in conjunction with diet and lifestyle to now really further assess risk, which there are no studies as far as I know. It's only, here's your genetic risk for this given outcome, but there's a lot more to that story. So I place very little emphasis on what the genome is. Um, even with demonstrated, you know, like, okay, you have the MTHR, uh, the, the, the methylfolate SNP, so maybe you'll have higher homocysteine, but then most people don't measure homocysteine. You've actually got to look at the downstream measures. So I see epigenetics as the you know, the modification, the methylation modification on DNA, 
as being as close to molecular as you can get. It's an important part of the story. In fact, if everything at the top is optimized, but the epigenetic stuff is not optimized, that could be the early warning signal. For example, my Horvath epigenetic age, which I know that the true diagnostic team is not a fan of because there are better tests of all cause mortality risk. Horvath's is not. It is the best clock for how old are you, but who cares how old are you if it doesn't predict your mortality risk? I see value in that because I don't want my, my predicted age to be older than my chronological age. It should be 18 years younger, like pheno age, like the other standard blood test markers, but it's not. So I see the epigenetics as the early warning sign, because if that data is aberrant, potentially other stuff up, upstream, the metabolites, the proteins, the cells will start to become aberrant because if your gene expression is messed up as the epigenetics is a, a, a marker of, are you having genes that are overexpressed or underexpressed? So to me, that's the early, the early warning sign. And I included it in the approach because I don't want to leave any of these boxes unchecked you know, I'm doing metabolomics, I'm doing the cells, you know, so white blood cells, red blood cells, you know, platelets, all of that stuff. And I'm also doing the big picture stuff, physical, physical function, leanness, you know, bone mineral density. So I see it as a part of the story. I don't see it as a binary, you know, epigenetics or the other. Now I know people in this space are placing a lot of emphasis on tests like Dunedin and Pace, but it's only a part of the story. You're number 15 on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard. And just for, for, for the listeners to, to, to see the comparison, I am number 520. <laughs> so, uh, what are your statistics here? So chronological age, biological age, pace of aging, longevity, oh, we already said that. And, uh, and have you got your symphony age results? So not yet on the symphony age. Um, it's very promising, but even, even, uh, and I guess I'm going to end up disagreeing with true diagnostic on this, but the omic age, I'm not, I'm not yet convinced about omic age or symphony age, even though they're both strongly associated with all cause mortality risk, Dunedin pace is in the same ballpark. So how much of a ROI am I getting by using those two other tests versus Dunedin pace? I don't know. I, I got a lot. So, so by the way, um, I, I don't even know what my symphony age is, but what I found it very interesting is that I always thought that I'm, I'm overweight, right? And I, my lungs are not great as well. So I was not really sure like which ones are, which one is the worst. And it turns out my lungs are worse than how overweight I am. And it, it really ended up in a way that I have very good genetics in terms of heart health and i am in the top i was 13 in 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 the heart stuff and 16 in the muscle stuff in symphony age but heart and and metabolic health was terrible so it did highlight to me that you know i i do work out properly for five years didn't skip a workout but but not eating properly right so it gave me a lot of a lot of value that, hey, these are the things that I should focus on and just, just don't worry about the other things because these things are breaking right now. Okay, so what's, so what's wait, your Dunedin piece? Um, yeah, wait, hang on, wait. So along those lines, and uh, again, I, I love and appreciate True Diagnostic. I, I'm a huge fan of them. But um, just to push back is, so for example, the lung prediction, that's a DNA methylation prediction of your lung function. Now, granted, the, the data was probably trained on people who actually measured lung function. And then they looked at marker genes that were associated with the actual lung function. So whatever the value, whatever, there are many ways to ass assess lung function to physically assess it rather than the prediction of it. So it seems like I'm tiptoeing on both sides of the fence where I appreciate the epigenetic predictions. But then on the other side, I'm kind of uh, saying that maybe the epigenetic predictions in all cases are not the best way to assess some kind of outcome. So for example, I've actually measured my lung function and I have a spirometer, which nothing too crazy expensive, a hundred and something dollars USD. I'm measuring it every week. Not <laughs> three times a week. And I'm able three. to, and it, and it, three day, three days per week. But, um, I, so I'm not doing it every day, but I've done that for now since uh, 2022. It declines during aging. Your forced expiratory volume declines during aging. Now, 
Am I going to place more value on an epigenetic prediction of that metric or the physical actual measure? So for example, too, the fit age is also a DNA methylation prediction of your strength or some fitness measure. I actually measure my strength at every workout. So for some things, there may be value. Um, for others, there may be more direct diet. For example, I can't measure telomere length as a, as a physical thing. Sure, I could use like uh, other, other methods that are a close approximation to telomere length as a cellular measure. So true diagnostic, true diagnostic is using a DNA methylation-based estimation of telomere length which isn't the actual telomere length measure, but there is published data that the DNA methylation-based estimation of telomere length may be a better metric relative to the actual measurement of telomere length. So for some things, the epigenetic estimation of a given outcome may be better. Whereas, for example, I can't measure telomere length physically, but for physical measures that I can measure, I look at the physical measures. I, I don't you know, I don't need someone to, to or, or I don't need a test to say your fitness age is this. Apologies for people in the language, but MF, or I can actually measure my fitness age. Physically, I can measure it. I don't need a prediction of it. I need a prediction of the things that I can't physically measure, right? All right. So, Dunit and Pace, uh, so it seems like I'm, I'm uh, bringing out the negative, a little bit of negativity. So, I think Brian's team, or maybe in conjunction with True Diagnostic, I don't know. So to get onto the leaderboard, you need it's your best three tests over two years. I, I don't like that approach. Even if it puts me at number 15, great. Because the fact is I have year to year data and it's not based on three tests. So I have 15 tests uh, since 2022. Now I only have three tests in 2022. Maybe that's not enough data for a, year, a full year average. In 2023, I tested eight times. And thus far I have data for four tests in 2024. So I, I see more value in looking at an eight-year average in 2023 versus a four-test average, a four-eight test average in 2023 versus a four-test average in 2024, or maybe you just take my 15-test average since 2022, right? Maybe that's more representative of three tests because when you do that, my average Dunedin and pace over 15 tests is 0.82. So I actually think I should be lower on the list. Now, would other people be lower on the list too if we took all of their data and tracked it versus their best data? I don't think you just take your best data. Anyway, so that, that's my spiel on that. Yes, my best data puts me at number 15, but if we took my average, I'd be a bit lower. That said though, the need and pace increases during aging. So if we look at the three tests in 2023, eight tests in 20, uh, eight, three tests in 2022, the A test in 2023 and the four tests in 2024, it has not increased. In fact, it's a little bit lower than where it was in 2022. So at worst, I've resisted an age-related increase. When considering it increases during aging, it gets harder for the people that you've interviewed, like uh, uh, Jeffrey Gladden and some of the others that are older than me, chronologically older, older than me, that have uh, similar data. It gets harder for someone of an older chronological age to have values of 0.6. Whereas people of a younger chronological age, like Seamland, and don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking Seam. I'm a huge fan of Seamland. Oh, huge fan. He's, he's going to be humongous in this field for decades. Uh, he's in his 20s. So for him to have a 0.66, I expect him to have that data. Or Genvel, who's in her 20s, I expect her to have data in their 20s. For someone of an older chronological age, Brian, who's you know still younger than me by a bit, it gets harder. So at worst... Or maybe at best for me, I've resisted any age-related increase over the past uh, two plus years, which is, a, for me, almost more informative than here are your best three tests over, over two years. But, so, so that's the Dunedin pace. Just for some context to the listeners, uh, the previous region national Olympics, before the big update, um, the previous one had two lists. One of the lists was um, the first one, the first result the need and pace result of yours compared to the next results and how much you are reducing compared to your first results so so that was not 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 a great list because like that doesn't only incentivize you to improve it also incentivize you to have as bad first result as you can so so anyway uh they they removed that but the second one was actually weight by ages right so 
if you were 100 years old and you had a 0.7 Dunedin pace, then you were ranking higher even than a person who is only 30 years old and has a 0.6 Dunedin pace. So, 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 so that was, that was, that was actually something very informative here. But here, after the update, what we got is just average Dunedin paces. And yeah, the younger people have an advantage because of their chronological age. Yeah. So, so that, that, that raises an interesting point. And I don't know if the true diagnostic uh, peeps are going to listen or Brian's team is going to listen, whoever's responsible is going to listen. Maybe, hopefully they do, because I think, you know, discussing it and what's the best way to look at it is, is important, you know? Uh, so I think the top of the leaderboard is going to be dominated, as you mentioned, by people, not just who are chronologically young, by women too, right? Women live longer than men on average. So I'd expect that women should have a slower epigenetic pace of aging relative to men at any chronological age. So the top of the leaderboard should be chronologically young women, right? So, but then you could, so do you, do you then have a gender specific, you know, uh, or sex, sex specific leaderboards, two different leaderboards, but then as you mentioned too, chronological age, right? So then do we start to group it by chronological age range? Because Someone like, you know, like someone who's chronologically 70 with a Dunita pace of 0.6, that's fantastic and should get more respect. I don't know, more respect, whatever, whatever respect that comes from that, whatever street cred, right? It's important to highlight that, you know? So, so that's another way to potentially look at it. But the other side of that too, as I mentioned, is that year to year change. Um, you know, maybe there are people like, so <laughs> it's funny because uh, I say, I say, I've got the secret sauce, right? I don't have, I don't necessarily have the secret sauce yet. And when you hear secret sauce, you think, what drugs are you taking? No, it, it's not it at all. But, you know, we touched on this earlier, you know, for the people that are taking every supplement on earth, every, every medicine on earth, trying to biohack their way to the super longevity, I've got the secret sauce. And the secret sauce is the data, you know, because people who are just throwing the kitchen sink at whatever biomarker of choice um, and are not actually tracking what they're doing. Maybe they'll have some success, but I don't anticipate long-term success with a pro approach like that. In contrast, over 15 tests, I haven't discovered the recipe for something like Dunedin Pace yet to get me down to 0.6 in that range. But based on other biomarkers, it's on, only a matter of time and data collection. So, so for me, that's the best approach. Now, even without that, yet, I see age, uh, 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 resisting age-related uh, increase. So, you know, initially they had that percent uh, uh, reduction from your first test, but then you'll have people that'll, you know, butch, you know, purposely butcher their first test, you know, just maybe you'll eat 8,000 8, calories a day before that can't result in a good Dunedin pace, or maybe you do that for a week, you end up with a Dunedin pace of 1.5 or whatever, 1.4, and then you really try hard and do all the right things. And then it's 0.9 and then you have this 60% reduction. You're at the top of the leaderboard for most improvement. There is some value in that, but you'll have people gaming the system, right? So I see value in looking at, at resisting age-related change, right? Here's people's data that started tracking five years ago, and they've seen no age-related change five years later. To me, that's important, right? You're resisting an aging process, right? So absolute values in terms of the number is important, or your best data is important, but what's your data over time? Uh, with way more than three tests. I see that. So we could do a four, four different uh, distinctions, separation based on sex, based on age, year to year change, best data over a given time period. Just wanna, wanna throw in that maybe in the future technology gets so good that we don't really need to worry about the, the, the woman versus uh, men distinction. But, but, you know, I just realized you're bringing the worst out of me because you're bringing the geekest geek out of me because I am I am that and I I have been talking on Bitcoin conferences and I realize myself when I'm start talking about UTXOs that ah oh no everyone lost me so I have an idea you have a lot of street cred now right number fifteen so let's talk about you um, what who who are you what 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 got you here and then my first question is. What's the adventure of your life? So before answering both of those, so technically I do fall into the geek category, right? But I think the stereotype of what a geek is, is this, you know, glasses wearing, frail, 
sits in front of a computer, crunched, you know, hunched back because of poor posture and doesn't care about anything aside from that esoteric knowledge. I do fall into that category, but you know, without trying to flex too much, I do, I do have a little bit, I do have a little bit of some guns, right? And I do have a six pack, right? So uh, I think I fall somewhat into the scientist warrior geek, if I was going to define myself now, I don't know warrior, how, how much of a warrior I am, but uh, I do have some of those genetics where if I, if I trained jujitsu and uh, taekwondo as a kid, which I didn't, but I just don't have the time to do it now. I'm training I Taekwondo with... right now. <laughs> You're taking it right now. I, I actually only do it for one week, but every day twice. <laughs> so the, some of the Taekwondo spin kicks and, and side kicks, front kicks, mm -hmm. back, I, that's a part of my approach. Part of it for the fun, but also for like, you know, uh, hip mobility. It's great for, you know, ad addressing different planes of movement. So anyway, I do fall into the geek category, but for those who don't know, I had a, you know, I don't want to have to take my shirt off, but there are shirtless pics of me all over the internet. You know, and I'm lean, you know, so I, I don't think I fit the classic geek stereotype where I'm just some nerd behind a desk. You know, I'm a little bit of other stuff too. I've always been interested in optimal health and fitness. Uh, I grew up on bodybuilding magazines back when magazines were actually a thing when I was a kid. And I had the thought like, you know, uh, <laughs> it sounds terrible. It's somewhat, uh, you know, sexist, I guess. I don't know, whatever the word is to say, but I always thought like the big dudes, the fit dudes, they always get the hottest chicks. I always thought that, right? That's always been a, a thing of mine. So whatever. Uh, so I was like, I want to be, I want to be fit and strong. I want, I want all the women to, 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 to be physically and sexually attracted to me. So since, since I was, I don't know, 12, 13, you know, I was a part of the gym life, right? Going to the gym often, getting fit and staying lean. I really didn't know anything about optimal health and nutrition. I tried every diet and supplement and, you know, pill under the sun uh, and then in my twenties, I got to the point, the point where I was just like, I, I don't know anything about this and I want to. So I read a, a book by Dr. Roy Walford, who, uh, wrote beyond the 120 year diet. And once I read that book, uh, the light bulb went off and, you know, the, the lack, I suffered from a lack of initiative and motivation and drive through my mid twenties in terms of life goals and passion and what's my purpose. What's my value? Uh, but once I, once I read his book, the light bulb went off. I want to study aging. I want to study the metabolomics and the biomarkers. Uh, I, I want to know about calorie restriction. I want to be optimally fit for as long as physically possible. Now, he died at 80. Um, he was CR for a big part of his life, but there are other parts of his lifestyle that may not have been optimal that may have contributed to his demise. That's a story for another day. But uh, that got me into, I need to go back to school. I need to, to learn hardcore biochemistry. I need to learn about physiology. That's where I got my, I did my PhD. So I, I basically got, got, took all the courses to get a uh, biochemistry degree, got into grad school where uh, the focus was on aging, one of the best places to study aging at the time with the goal of studying aging as a scientist. And then the rest is history. You know, I've been in academia for the past, uh, you know, since uh, 2003. Uh, so I'm probably going to get out sooner rather than later to focus on doing this stuff for, you know, myself and others full time. Um, so yeah, so that's how I, how I got into it. What about your tribes, uh, both meat space and cyberspace? Um, what kind of people are you surrounding yourself? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'd say most of my tribe is cyber based. That's because... <laughs> So I'm an, I'm an odd monkey. I've always been an odd monkey. I, I've always had a hard time fitting in with, uh, you know, general society. The things I'm interested in, most people are not interested in. Um, and when I start talking about things that I'm interested in, I get the, he's a weird dude and all this stuff. But online, it's always been, you know, it's kind of like, and you know, again, I'm trying not to be egotistical, but it, it comes off. I hope it doesn't come off as that, but there's a line in the matrix, which I, I love all the matrix movies. And then you'll have people who say, I like the first one and hated the others, but every one of those I can relate to, but there's a line where Smith says to Neo, you know, you're, it seems to be, you're living two lives in this one life. You've got this and this other life you've got that. Right. So, uh, the cyber world has always, um, attracted me more because now I can relate to people internationally who share similar interests, uh, regardless of geographical location. And, and, uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I don't know where my mental health would be if uh, I haven't developed that over the past 15 or so years. So the majority of my stuff is, the majority of my interactions with people and friendships are, are cyber-based. 
That said too, I generally, it's hard, hard to get me out in person. I'm not the type to go traveling to places just to see places. If I would, for example, if I'm going to go somewhere like, you know, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, you know, so to see some of these giant megalithic structures that exist all over the world, which I'm interested in, I wouldn't just go there as a tourist and take pictures and selfies in front of these things like most people do. Hey, look at me. I'm, I'm looking pretty in front of Angkor Wat. It's just not my thing. I'd want to be at Angkor Wat and taking pictures of things that nobody's paid attention to for maybe thousands of years. I'd want to be excavating thousands of feet under the ground. So I, I'm back to the scientist mindset, right? So, uh, so most people uh, in real life, IRL, don't generally relate to that. You know, they just want to do their superficial stuff. So, and I'm okay with that. That's my niche. But so anyway, it's generally hard to get me out in a social setting. And I wasn't always like that. It's just, um, I, try to, I try to have my time be most used valuably with people who appreciate that time and vice versa, where I appreciate their time. Where it's an equal value addition where I'm gaining something from them and they gain something from me. So that's how I see social interactions now in real life and cyber-based. So if, if the in real life stuff, it's just some general social function, I'll decline or won't go or try to get out of it as fast as I can, uh, for better or worse, right? Are you spiritual and or religious? Yeah, yeah. I appreciate the questions, Adam. I do. These are fantastic. So not religious, technically agnostic, as close to atheist as you can get, but nobody knows. People who pretend to know on both sides, atheists and theists, there's no way to know. Spiritual, is there something beyond that? I don't know. You know, so you, in the realm of quantum physics, right, there's entanglement, right? So if you can reduce a human existence to the quantum level, is that existence entangled with an existence somewhere else? In this universe and another universe somewhere else? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Will I find out once this existence ceases? I don't know either. That's why I'm trying to squeeze the orange of as much life in this existence, in this form as I physically can, because I don't know if there's anything on the other side. So that, that yeah, that's how I look at how I look at that. Uh, we evolved to perceive a very small portion of reality. You know, our senses don't perceive everything that exists. We can't see in the infrared. We can develop devices to see in the infrared, but we didn't evolve to see in the infrared. So we can't physically detect things that actually exist with just our senses. So for me to say this is real or that's real based on my senses is only a small portion of reality. So I, I can't pretend to know if anything exists beyond this realm of existence. If there are higher dimensions or lower dimensions, string theory or whatever quantum physics may predict, multiverses, I don't know. How does that tie into spir spirituality? I think understanding the nature of reality is a prelude to having some spirituality. I think that people who have very little understanding of reality try to ascribe everything to a God or some universal spiritual thing. I don't know. And if there is some God that created me, they'd understand that everything they created isn't going to believe in it, right? And there is some probability of that. You're going to have some probability who are unplugged from the matrix. Assuming I am unplugged, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I don't know that that answered the question, but that's my perspective. <laughs> you see, I went to a, a spiritual journey myself, like more like an intellectual journey. I decided to learn about all the philosophical ideas that there are at least just very little because I just wanted to learn more about reality and all I learned that this has been for for many years every weekend i spent many hours on on all kinds of logics and all kinds of um, ethics and philosophies and religions and and I, I try to learn about all these things i just realized no one has this shit figured out you know so i i got to take a very similar approach to you um now i say i am a pragmatist you know Whatever works, man. Whatever works. <laughs> I, I roll with it. But being a good person, right, is a part of that because if whatever rolls is bad stuff, right? So that's another part of it too, where I don't want to cause anyone stress, uh, but I also don't want to be stressed. So I try to be as Zen, you know, not that that leans me towards Buddhism or anything else, but I try to be as, you know, I just try to be a good person, you know, right? So, um, well, is, is, good, is being a good person a good idea in all contexts? 
uh, I guess you'd have to be selfish if your life was at risk, right? So, and then maybe you're not being a good person, but but even then maybe sacrifice one to save a thousand and maybe you're that one that would have to be sacrificed. I mean, you know, maybe you have to be selfish in that, in that role because maybe your, your life is more important than a thousand. I don't know. It's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard gamble to weigh, right? You know, so. There, there are, there are no universal truths. All right. Uh, last, last, last segment. Um, I want to just ask you about all the different kinds of, you know, movement, sleep, vices, whatnot. Uh, f firstly, firstly, just could you describe a day in your life? Yeah, let's see. So an ideal day, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. yes, right now, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, there, there are two, two, two versions of that. Uh, for, some, for some reason, I've always had the vision of Beach House. Uh, surrounded by at least one woman, maybe more, uh, mutual respect, love, whatever you want to consider it. Um, I do have a 15 year old, so, you know, uh, there have been women in my life where, <laughs> right. That have been close enough to the point where, you know, we have what that love would be or mutual respect enough to reproduce, but that's been a rare thing, you know, where, uh, so the ideal version would, would be, uh, you know, to have a compatible partner or partners, right? Um, you know, but I'm also open to the fact where maybe that's just not going to be the case and I've just got to conquer aging or die trying and that's what I'm here to do if that is such a perspective, right? Or, you know, it, it either is going to happen or not. So an ideal would be on the beach, uh, chilling with loved ones, um, stress-free, while also having this other stuff, the other side of this, which is, Obviously, I'm going to still spend a significant portion of my time documenting the approach in terms of uh, biohacking, quote unquote, biohacking aging and the science behind it and all of that. So, you know, an ideal day is, uh, you know, wake up, eat, analyze my data, analyze others' data, read the literature, prepare new videos, because I'm obsessed with that. Like, I've got so many tabs open for videos that I could make that I just don't have the time because my life right now is pulled in other directions by commitments that I don't have a choice right now, but that hopefully will change in the next year or so. So um, there are a ton more videos that I can make, uh, get in some exercise, and literally I can analyze data and make videos all day. I mean, and love doing it. So, you know, a combination of the beach, getting some sun, growing some of my own food, if not all, hanging out with my loved ones, making videos, documenting the approach, all of that exercise, that's all part of the optimal day for me. I don't have all of that right now, clearly, but uh, you know, I don't want to say on the mental health journey, I've been far from where I am now and I'm working towards that. So you're not running away from sun? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Working towards the fully enlightened, fully, you know, as happy as I can be approached. Do you have any vices? So I guess junk food is a vice, but uh, I've, learn to minimize it. it i i wouldn't say conquer it because it's kind of like saying an alcoholic has conquered their alcoholism so from my early you know so i grew up on junk food my mom would buy boxes of cakes and cookies and and i'd eat 2000 calories of cake and just go to the park and run around and play basketball for three hours of baseball whatever it was but it caught up to me in my 20s and 30s where um, you know, I started to gain some weight and be in suboptimal condition. And, you know, I had this binge kind of anorexia or binge purge cycle where I'd eat 10,000 calories and then cut my calorie intake over five or so days so that I'd get relatively lean. But that was terrible for my physical, emotional and, and uh, cognitive health. So I love eating cookies and cakes and all this other stuff. It's, a, it's an addiction. I think it's an addiction for most people. So I've learned to manage it where, you know, I've minimized that binge aspect of my personality. So alcoholism runs in my family. I, I don't have that problem, problem, fortunately, but, you know, this junk food addiction is in my DNA, um, especially in large amounts. So after a blood test, it seems that if I do have some quote unquote cheat, and I know Brian doesn't have any cheats, although he did mention that he had like some bread recently, which is a cheat. But uh, for me, if I go completely cold turkey with any junk, that sets me up for one of these binges, and I don't want that. That's the antithesis of optimal health. So immediately after the blood test, I'll have some uh, quote-unquote junk, 
you know, whether it's chocolate mixed with sugar and peanut butter or cheesecake, whatever it may be, whatever I'm craving on that day, but sticking to my calorie goals, but not paying attention to the macros and micros. So not sticking to the macros and micros, which I do for every day is not followed for two to three days. I've stuck to two days immediately after the blood test, but for whatever reason, after this blood test, I didn't stick to it for three days after the blood test while still eating a decent diet, but I had other stuff that I wanted, but calories were on track, on track. Um, so I'm basically satiated with the junk and then it's like, I don't want any more. And then I, I, I cut the junk out until the next test. So I've managed it. I don't think I'll ever conquer it. If I think I've conquered it, I'll end up binging and that's terrible for me in every way. So, okay. So no hookers and Coke. Um, where did the data, <laughs> where did the data led you in terms of diet right now? What's, what's your, yeah, yeah wait, wait, what so, are you so, eating? So when you consider that, that, that the majority of women aren't generally attracted to me and I, I don't say that happily, I wish the opposite were true, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's the physical or what's in my hair, where's your hair? Yeah. I shave it off. Right. But you can see if it grew in, I'd have a patch and then some here, and then there'd be a patch. So I'm not trying to, you're not trying to rejuvenate your hair. Not yet. It's not, it's not limiting to lifespan. Right. So anyway, the hookers. Yeah at this point would probably make me more sad than happy because it's a superficial treat, I guess. And then, you know, it's not a, I'm looking for a more long lasting kind of thing, but the Coke too, or any other quote unquote fun stuff, but I'm not opposed to it. You know, I do have clients that do some of that stuff and, and, you know, it, it's a matter of dose. How much of it can you get? I don't, I'm as straight edge as you can get, but for others that don't want to be as straight edge, you know, the question is, how much of it can you get away with the fun stuff where it then starts to negatively impact your health, quality of life, your biomarkers. And if somebody wants to do some of that stuff and none of their biomarkers look bad at very low doses or microdosing, whatever it may be, you know, go for it. I'm not anti-fun. I'm pro biomarkers. I'm not anti-fun. What's the balance of both, right? I mean, only one night of <laughs> doing it, like the next day is completely, you have like three days, your biorhythm completely done uh, yeah not not coke not just coke right just alcohol right we're staying um, up late staying up late throws it off or or overeating too much a certain amount of calories throws it off yeah i know what that feels like for the overeating and staying up late and i try to i try my best to feel good every day not okay so we didn't we still didn't find out what you're eating ah yeah so that that i mean i uh, not that that's a secret right? i post that everywhere for for those who don't know but the, the diet is rich in, so I eat, I guess I have to start with, I eat fish every day, sardines are in the approach every day. I'm not vegan. And that's only because the biomarkers uh, suggest that it may be optimal for me. So I'm not vegan, but the diet is mostly plant-based outside of that. I do include eggs sometimes. I'm open to including beef, but there, like you said, there are only so many calories in the approach and other stuff has stronger correlations in my data than eggs and beef. Whereas sardines are giving me omega-3s, Omega threes decline during aging. Besides the correlations, I like them. They're more satiating than eggs and beef. So if I was going to go higher on meat, it would be with uh, fish. Okay. Outside of that, carrots and red bell peppers are staples in the diet. Carotenoids seem to have a big positive impact on my data. So alpha and beta carotene, beta cryptoxanthin from the red bell peppers, tomatoes and watermelon for lycopene, which are, are carotenoids, uh, about a pound or 450 grams of collard greens as a low oxalate green for lutein and zeaxanthin. Uh, those are all staples based on the data. And I've titrated their amounts, some of those, their amounts higher over time based on the data. So collard greens, I started off with like 270 grams or so per day. And now I'm up to 450, pushing the correlations to see, you know, is this really a, a positive effect? And to, to do that, I've cut carrots down from about uh, a pound a day down to 270, trying to you know, bottom of the U shape. So anyway, all right. So those are staples. Beets are a staple, um, mostly for the uh, nitric oxide potential effects and potential effects on blood pressure, but also a very strong net positive correlative score. And it's, it's also crazy to say, but nitric oxide is a big part of the uh, the beet story. And I, it's like nature's Viagra. You know, I hate, you know, I see Brian trying to do pe penis rejuvenation and tracking his uh, nocturnal, nocturnal hard-ons. And I don't want to say I don't have a problem. Very with that, but... most important research. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. 
but I don't have a problem there. I don't know what's optimal, but I don't have a problem there. And I don't know if it's because of 330 grams of beets per day, but, uh, so beets are, a, uh, beets are a part of the everyday approach. Parsley's in the everyday approach, uh, to potentially inhibit CD38 as a part of the NAD story. Uh, strawberries, frozen strawberries, which I make in a smoothie with the beets and parsley and some flavoring agent like ginger, cinnamon, or uh, vanilla beans. So I eat a lot of strawberries, uh, probably about 500 grams per day, frozen strawberries, staple in the approach. Nuts and seeds, a mix of almonds, peanuts, walnuts, flax seeds, uh, which cover a, a variety of bases, um, some of which omega-3, monounsaturated fats, fiber, niacin, et cetera. Dates are in there, mostly to sweeten up the flax seeds. Uh, Brazil nuts for the selenium. Let's see if I'm missing it out. I eat a cooked mix, cooked mix with the collard greens, tomatoes, chickpeas, which may have a positive impact on kidney function in my data. Uh, turmeric, black pepper, which seem to be an all-star for multiple bio biomarkers. I do add some salt to that, but a very small amount. Mustard powder for uh, the sulforaphane and broccoli, which is also a part of the approach. So uh, cardamom and, and, and cloves. So there's a lot. I list it all in diet composition videos without the sake of boring you too much more about my diet. These are, these are daily. These daily. are your staple. Uh -huh. Staples. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. Um, what about your peers? How many peers do you take a day? Yeah. So right now, consistently nothing. Um, oh, nothing. Not, nothing right now. Uh, in the for about nine months of the of the year, I supplement with vitamin D, a thousand I use per day. Uh, I have not got that answer yet. For, from for a rejuvenation vitamin. Olympic athlete to take not a single pill right now. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. But that that's not all year round like that, right? So. And like, you know, so next week when, once rapamycin comes, I'm going to be on rapamycin for probably two weeks, maybe a bit, a bit less. Well, actually it's got to be, it takes about a week to get the candida results. So that's at least a two week supplemental mm -hmm. period, but the vitamin D is there. I don't take it in the summer. Unlike Brian, I try to get sun exposure without sunscreen. Um, it's hard in Boston though, because the cloudy days and weather's not always great, but I did the experiment of only had sun exposure for like four days so far in two, two months. And my vitamin D was 38, which I want to be above 30. How much above 30 is optimal for 25 hydroxy D who knows, but that's with no supplementation and only four days of sun and I'm not deficient. And usually I get a lot more sun in the summer. So that illustrates that I don't need vitamin D in the summer. I do have NMN, which I play around with. I do have nicotinic acid, which I play around with, but even there, I'm still trying to optimize NAD through diet. Uh, with not much success yet, but that's it. That's it for supplements. Uh, I do use supplemental vanilla in the in the mouthwash to try to kill off uh, a bad microbe in my oral microbiome. So that's technically a supplement. I do have vitamin B6, which I've experimented with, but I haven't used that in a while. But yeah, nothing other than an occasional vitamin D right now. If I don't get sun for a week and rapamycin, yeah, nothing, nothing for off and on NMN and nicotinic acid, but nothing consistent. Where did you get those guns? <laughs> what, the, 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 it's not. <laughs> How do you I'm, move? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not a big guy. I just lean, you know? So, I mean, you look like this, maybe not that big, but the workouts are uh, 90 minutes, compound movements. You know, I'm not doing bicep curls and tricep push downs. I'm doing overhead presses and clean and jerks and pull-ups, you know? Yeah. Trying to stay as fit and strong as possible. Not lose an ounce of strength during aging. 90 minutes is a lot. No. Yeah, I used to go longer. It used to be a three-hour workout, but the heart rate variability and resting heart rate was terrible, overtrained. I felt tired all the time. Uh, so I could go longer. It, you know, part of it is a mental thing too, where, you know, if you're running, you know, running becomes a mental thing after a while where, you know, you run a certain amount of time. And, it, you know, if you're doing sprints, it's not a mental thing. It's very simple and quick, right? But if you're running for 10 and 20 minutes, it's a challenge. It's a mental challenge, right? So part of it is the challenge. You know, I want to, I don't want to just do an in and out workout and be done. I really want to, you know, <laughs> it's my brain, right? It's, it's all right, MF, or let's go. Like, uh, your, 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 your data, your data suggests you're recovered. Let's go. Don't, you know, don't bitch out. You know, uh, you're not going for 45 minutes. You're, you're going for every rep on every set. Um, for all 90 minutes and I don't want it to be 95 and I want it to be 99. Like I do a set workout so that I can track it over time. So if I go longer, 
I'm being an old man, you know, because which uh, it sounds like a slur, but you know, the old phenotype is old mice have to take more breaks when they run, right? They need more rest and recovery. So if I can do the same workout, the same sets and reps, same weight for every movement that I'm doing for a standardized workout as I'm 20, as when I'm 90, 100 plus in the same amount of time, how much have I aged? How aged is my physiology at that point? So that's a challenge, right? Some of that is a challenge and it's, it's almost like I'm literally fighting against aging, aging in that moment. For example, my pull-ups have been 12 to 13 and these are, you know, strict above the bar. None of this, I'm barely getting there, you know, for, I don't know, five, six years. But I was also 15 to 20 pounds heavier during that time, probably had a bit more muscle mass. So as I've gotten leaner, it's gotten harder to get to the 12, forget 13. Now, there is going to be some small amount of muscle function loss with a 20 pound weight loss, right? It's almost impossible to not lose some amount of lean mass and lose 20 pounds of weight, which I'm okay with. But lately, it's, or not lately, but in the past couple of months, it's been 10 reps of pull ups. 10, now I'm down two reps. Is that, is that because of the, the weight loss and lean mass loss? Is this a motivation thing? Is this an aging thing? So now my mind is like, all right, MF or let's go. Are you just being lazy? Like, are you just bored with pull-ups? Like, so I'm back to 11, but I've got to get back to 12 before it's two years have passed. And now I'm back to 10. And now I've aged, right? For whatever reason. So, um, so yeah, it's a 90 minute thing, but a lot, a lot of this is a mental thing, you know, and I try to push myself me mentally, not just physically. You see, you couldn't be more different in this from me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the exact opposite. So I'm, I'm of course doing the, this three times a week, um, some resistance training, but maybe it's 30 minutes, 40 minutes at maximum, but, uh, I'm doing it even that in a way that I have like, um, periods, maybe, maybe half a year periods, every half a year I decide, okay, so this half a year, I'm doing kettlebell. This half a year, I'm doing body weight. This half a year, I'm doing bodybuilding. So I'm periodizing and always changing up. And this way, I can keep my motivation up. But I'm also doing the, you know, well, I call it cardio, but often it's just playing with my kids. <laughs> so, um, but, 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 but what I'm, I'm most proud of, because this is a unique, unique solution, and, and I, I think you couldn't incorporate this into your routine that uh, every day I ha I do three workouts in the morning, in the middle of the day and at night. These are just 10 minute workout, five to 15. And in the morning, um, I put on some, some video and this can be absolutely anything. For one week, I'm doing a single video, right? It can be right now I'm doing Taekwondo, right? Next week I'm going to do karate and then kickboxing. So now I'm, I'm going through martial arts, but it can be Tai Chi or, 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 or whatnot, whatever you can find. Like I see Dave Pasco is doing P90X and I want to know what P90X. So I put it on that I am going to try that thing out for a week. So in the middle of the day, as I told you, my lungs are not great so i'm doing breath work which is i don't know if it, it it does things right i can hold my breath for a long time now i'm doing the Wim Hof stuff but uh, i i have no idea if it actually does the, like, like does it have my breath but uh, i have to throw shit to to uh, everything at it except the the kitchen sink right so in that night, it's more like mobilization or stretching or, or whatnot. I'm not quite sure what should I do at night. I definitely shouldn't work out, but I don't, I don't believe in stretching. So <laughs> anyway, but I stretch. But what you're doing is that you're, you have a very strict regimen and you're not playing around. So, right? But that's, that it, it's evolved over time into that. So I, I've been in that approach too, where I've tried everything and changed it up. That doesn't work for me. Like, so if I'm doing, you know, instead of doing pull-ups, I'll do pull-downs or, you know, more rows or something. Let's just say for my, for my lats and my back and, and biceps, right? If I'm not 
So if I'm changing it up and then I go back to pull-ups at some period of time, because I haven't trained that movement, it ends up being weaker. So sure, I got general muscle stimulus and maybe it's more fun because I've got more variety, but now I've got to work back to get to where I was for the number of reps on pull-ups, right? So for me, it works better for me to, to have a standardized workout. I, I, don't, I don't generally suffer from motivation unless I'm in some amount of sleep debt and my heart rate variability, resting heart rate are below average. Nothing impacts my motivation worse than even a mild sleep debt. So I generally don't have problems with, uh, now I have to do this movement during the workout or the, uh, like I enjoy, I, I enjoy all of the, you know, and I have even like a, a whole routine is, is basically mapped for those 90 minutes. It isn't, well, I feel like doing this at this time, I'll do this. It's, it's a certain order. I do it in order. Um, because for example, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do pull-ups and then do a row, right? So I'm doing super, the whole thing is a cardio workout for 90 minutes. It's basically circuit training. So, so, you know, there's an order to that whole process where I can do it the most efficiently, not just in terms of time, but in terms of maximizing gain, both cardiovascularly and functionally. Right. So, and everything in there too is, is with the goal of, like you mentioned, stretching, stretching is a big part of it. Mobility is a big part of it. Balance is a big part of it where I'm actively training those things during the workout. Now, if I was doing other stuff to change it up, I wouldn't be tracking those things because I wouldn't be actively doing them. I'd be doing other stuff. Whereas workout to workout, week to week, I can see how I'm progressing or not, and then do more, do less to try to improve a given, a given movement. So, Oh, here is an idea. Try out Animal Flow. You heard about no, it? Animal Flow? Animal Flow. Animal Flow. Yeah, Animal Flow. Yeah. Move around like an anima. If if you ever need a change, then you can try that because you can do that in a more structured way as well. But you can also get a feel of of play. You so know? that's a uh, more like uh, capoeira. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from capoeira and a bunch of other things. Um. Anyway, what about your sleep? I right, wait. So I had some more about the uh, exercise. So so. You know, there's this idea that's pervading that, you know, as high a VO2 max and as, as work out as much as you can to be as physically strong as you can. But I'm in a slightly different boat where I'm not aiming for my peak capacity in terms of function. It's, I'm happy to be above average for my genetics, but I also don't want to overtrain, which the markers of stress being heart rate variability. And I don't think the majority of people in this field that influencer space is looking at it like that. For example, not to name drop, but I know Peter Atia is the get your VO2 max as high as possible, but the, the energy cost and work involved to get there is an amount of stress that may not optimize heart rate variability and resting heart rate. And in that case, when considering that exercise is well known to increase average lifespan, but not maximal, where are the 120 year old marathon runners or fitness enthusiasts in animal models, wheel running uh, in rats gets them an average lifespan increase, but does not get them to the maximum. So there's something great about exercise, but also bad for maximal lifespan. I want the max and beyond. So for me, it's what's the dose of exercise that gets me as close or beyond to the maximal while not being overtrained using the metrics as a guide for that. So I'm happy to not have my peak strength or peak VO2 max, but to have above, above average levels and resist age-related decline. For me, those are more important metrics than a VO2 max of 65, like an elite endurance athlete, but have heart rate variability of age expected and, and resting heart rate, right? So, um, all right, so that's the exercise story. I wanted to make sure I got that out there. Sleep is still a work in progress, immensely better than it's been. Um, I sleep with earplugs because I'm on a busy Boston street. Hopefully sooner than later, that's not the case. I'll be closer to the rural, rural and out of the city, out of city life. I have a blackout shade, but I do have some light pollution because I'm on the street and it's got lights there. Room temperature and humidity seems to have a big impact on my sleep quality which is not great because although my AC works better when it's not 90 degrees Fahrenheit, it struggles in the extreme heat in Boston at least. So that impacts sleep quality. So that's something I'll have to improve once uh, I live somewhere else, not in this city. But sleep consistency, going to, the same time, uh, going to bed at the same time every night is almost a constant. 
It's rare when I'm asleep later than usual. I mean, sometimes I'll have some academic stress, which I can't stand, which will get in the way of sleep quality where my, on, my sleep onset will be an hour and a half later just because I'm thinking about bullshit that I don't like thinking about, which is one reason <laughs> to get out of academia. But generally, that's not the case. I try to minimize that. But going to sleep at the same time every night, trying to sleep as much as I physically can, which doesn't always work. Sometimes I'm even 30 minutes of sleep that where if I can, I'll take a nap on that day to catch up. But yeah, sleep optimization. The eating window is early, generally ending it before the majority of it before 1 p.m., sometimes even uh, 11 to 12 a.m. to give as much time to pee out all the water-rich fruits and vegetables that I'm eating. But that's probably where the weakness is in my data, where I still wake up sometimes, use the bathroom at night two times during the night. And PSA is 0.3. It's not I don't have prostate problems, or at least I don't think I have prostate problems based on PSA levels. Uh, so I don't think it's that. It's probably a chronically hydrated problem. But ending the eating window as early as possible helps minimize that because I used to have uh, OMAD. I used to eat OMAD and eat from like six to nine at night, fast all day. And I was up at 10, 11, 12, one. The sleep was terrible. So uh, I've minimized that dramatically. Sleep, sleep quality is in, in, immeasurably better. Uh, and nothing affects my mental health more than, uh, you know, a great night of sleep. And I like having good mental health, not feeling depressed. So, yeah, it, it, it seems like you can, you can improve upon stuff on, on sleep. So might, might, might come even farther along than 15th place on the rejuvenation Olympics. I, <laughs> if I'm, you not, get I'm not sure how much sleep makes it better because that's been pretty much a constant. But if my sleep quality was worse in duration, I'd imagine it'd be worse. I don't know that I can further improve the need and pace based on sleep. There are other stuff, other secret sauce. Maybe I'll put that, put that conquer aging or die trying secret sauce, secret juice. So what's the secret juice? Is there, a, is, there a, is there something extra that you're doing that other people don't do? And that's the secret sauce. The secret juice is the data. It's tracking the data, following the data, you know, and Aside from the people that I'm working with as clients who are doing that themselves too, or I'm tracking their data and helping them make evidence-based uh, suggestions and people that are watching the YouTube videos that may be trying it on their own, I don't think very many people have that secret sauce, right? And maybe it's not the secret sauce immediately. Maybe it takes three years of discovering the secret juice recipe, right? But um, things that are resistant to change, biomarkers that are res resistant to change, I've found that they are not resistant to change using this approach. So. I've got the secret juice for now. We'll see if we'll see how long I can live using this, the secret sauce. But uh, yeah, so far so good. What about the environment, ha house, like uh, physical spaces? Yeah. I mean, uh, light. I'd say right now it's not optimal. Uh, it could be better. So right now I'm in a one bedroom in Boston, but the benefit there is that I'm very close to work. So uh, it's a very short commute. So if the commute was longer everything would be worse. Physical, mental health, uh, road rage, all the things that suck about commuting. Yeah. At some point that I'm working, uh, working on, uh, getting my own house, you know, over the next, and like I said, moving to the rural area or more rural area, uh, less air, air pollution, less noise pollution. That's definitely on the to-do list. So you're doing it next to work while you're raising a child alone and and building your your own application is is that so yeah i, I don't have a life you, that's my whole life right there uh, you know and the youtube channel <laughs> yeah, that's it. well yeah and the youtube channel yeah so that's literally everything i awesome. do from from the time that i'm not working on academic stuff it's time with you know the the, the 15 year old it's the youtube it, it, every second of the day not just every calorie every second of the day is pretty much accounted for sometimes i do screw around right because you can one can't focus on academic pursuits all day, every day. I'm not that guy. And I'll look at just dumb stuff. And then I'm like, what am I doing? You know, five minutes later, I'm like, what am I doing? And that gets me back into what I was doing. Right. So uh, there's a balance between focusing on nonsense and focusing on the really serious stuff. So I do have a little bit of nonsense, you know, that I'll pay attention to. Any other athletes on the rejuvenation leaderboard that you know? Uh, Dave and I have corresponded a few times. Brian and I have... Uh, corresponded by email a few times, one time on Zoom. Anybody else that I know? Genvel, we had a we uh, texted a few times, talked 
once or twice, John or Josh Best, a mm -hmm. little bit of communication. I think you interviewed him. Uh, not yet. Ah, not yet, <laughs> but a little bit on Twitter. I'm trying to think of anybody else. I've tagged Steve Aoki, telling him he needs to catch up. I've tagged Peter Diamandis, telling him he, he needs to catch up too. No, no response. No, couldn't reach them either. Yeah, it, there are some people that just post and don't don't reply, which is kind of like the TV. And I fucking hate TV. I haven't had a TV for <laughs> 15 years or so. So if there are people on X or social media where they'll post and they don't respond to anybody, unless it's with some kind of check mark or a certain amount of followers, I, I, it's, it's a huge turnoff. I have in my to-do list to reply to people half a year ago, right? Like <laughs> they send me a private message. Like I, I, I do, I prioritize everything yeah. that I do. I, I use a Trello board but because I had a company and I had to prioritize other people's time. So I, I, I decided to use the exact same process for myself and, and now I, there are people I cannot literally reply. It's, it's, it's not in my, my, my priorities. Yeah. I, I totally objectively. So <laughs> I try to respond to everyone, I, but I get what you're saying because they, it gets to a point where, <clears throat> so think about it. Every YouTube video I make, if a hundred or 200 people respond, but now I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Reddit. I'm posting in five different subreddits. And like I said, I do that on purpose because I want the feedback, good, bad, or ugly. Right? So. I try to respond to everything. So there's only so much time in the day and it becomes a triage where you can't respond to everyone. But if someone's making a physical post somewhere, people have responded and it's, you know, you kind of lose, you know, there may be people like, for example, I look at someone like Brian and Brian is the closest thing that I could think of. Brian, actually Dave too. And Dave and I communicate pretty regularly on Instagram or have communicated pretty regularly, but I look at people in this space who are doing things similar to me, and I think we should all be best buds. Like, you know, so if Brian posts something on X and I'm one of the people who comment and he doesn't see it, he's not reading his own comments, he's, I think he's potentially losing out and vice versa, right? So, you know, if I'm posting something and people are commenting and I'm not looking, I'm potentially losing out on relationships or interactions that could benefit me and vice versa. So not everybody sees it like that, but. Just going back to the TV, it's like the TV only talks. It doesn't care if you talk back to it. And again, I, I F and hate the TV and I don't want to be like that. So, but I get the balance, right? You can only respond to so many people. Yeah, my, my generation doesn't watch TV, so what's your <laughs> not sure what you're talking about. So what's your chronological age? 30. Oh, okay. So I don't want to say I'm a great thinker. People can decide that or not for themselves. They can think I'm rubbish or, or the other side of that, but. Sometimes people at the far right side of the normal distribution aren't appreciated in their time. And I can think of people, there are a handful, handful of people I can think of that have been in science for now that have great ideas that aren't going to be appreciated for probably two or three generations afterwards. So am I in that boat? I don't know. But it's interesting because like people of your generation and in that ballpark, in that age range, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a generation or two ahead of my time, right? Where, you know, you fast forward. 75 years, 50 years, 25 years, when will we have this technology in our homes, right? Where calculating the correlations is something you wake up and based on your biometrics, whether it's peeing in the toilet, pooping in the toilet, or some finger prick blood test, whatever it may be, you've got your data for the day. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but Gattaca, have you ever seen the movie Gattaca? So it's a basically a genetic version of the future. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. If you put the, if you like the matrix, it's in there too. The, the Gattaca is in there too. A different kind of movie, but Anyway, there's a scene in the movie where one of the characters, he looks at a watch or a wearable and someone else asks him, how long do you need? And he says, I need 20 minutes, right? So that's based on some prediction, right? So that's the future I see. So if my approach is quantified into some technology, which I anticipate it's going to be at some point, 5, 10, 15, whenever it may be, it's going to be like an everyday thing for some gen younger generation, right? And maybe the Younger generations look at me as the, as the OG, right? So anyway, anyway, I don't want to say... There is no reason why your toilet shouldn't be analyzing the shit out of you. <laughs> that's a great... That's a t-shirt. You got to put that on a t-shirt. That's fantastic. There's no reason your toilet shouldn't be analyzing the shit out of you, literally. But anyway, so if, if this stuff is a generation or two ahead of its time, you know, we'll see. Okay, so no lead up, just the question. What is, what is one thing 
that many people disagree with you, but you strongly believe to be the case. Yeah, that's interesting. Are there things that you think might be true like that in my case? I can't think of anything off the top of my head. If you tell me to sleep well, well, yeah, thanks. Like, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> You're not saying anything. Everyone knows that you should sleep well. But if you tell me something that a lot of people disagrees with, but you actually think that, hey, this is the thing that I, I strongly believe, like, you might actually give me some food for thought, provide me some value. Yeah, yeah, I get the premise. The only reason I'm having trouble with it because is because uh, if I believe something so strongly that I'm married to that idea, for me, it, it, I lack an open-mindedness in that scenario. And I hope that I'm not married to any of my ideas so strongly where I'm not open to someone else's perspective. So I tend to think that I'm not married to an idea or an approach so strongly that I don't consider that something else could be true. So I think the first thing that pops into my mind is there is no one size all, one size fits all for diet. So, um, and this may be controversial, but the idea that someone could be on a carnivore or an animal-based diet and it's a suboptimal approach relative to other diets, maybe that's controversial. And the reason I say that is, is and I'm not on a carnivore diet, I'm far from it almost exclusively plant-based. But I think that based on someone's biomarkers, if you show me the net of your biomarkers are improved on a given diet, carnivore, vegan, whatever it may be, I, I'm open to it, right? But just the idea that your diet is X, it can't be good because Mediterranean diet seems to be the best, which by the way, the Mediterranean diet is only a shade better than the Western diet. It's like, it's not much better. I mean, it's pizza and pasta. Uh, I don't know pizza, <laughs> but it's a little bit better. But there are higher levels even to the what's considered a Mediterranean diet. You know, um, for example, I'll give you a quick example. So, yeah, I know what the research considers to be a Mediterranean diet is very different from. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. So, <clears throat> so, but uh, that's the first thing that I, I could think of. But I don't know if there if there's something that you think maybe that I would be very strongly. I mean, the core, my core philosophy is you got to test. Like, you know, people, some people will come at me with so much certitude sometimes uh, in the comments, YouTube comments or elsewhere, where, you know, I'll show the data, I'll show the mechanistic hypothesis, and they'll say, you got to do X, Y, or Z with so much certitude. And uh, so you could say they think something and I think differently, but it's like most people have an idea based on what they expect to be to be true based on limited evidence or belief, you know, so I try not to be like that. You know, it's, uh, I try to be open-minded. So I don't, I don't know that that answers your question, but I try to be open-minded enough to where it isn't so binary. You know what I mean? Where I try to be able to understand everybody's perspectives, even, even, you know, if you say, what's your political, how do you lean politically? Right. There are some things that I agree with, uh, conservative Republicans about and other things I, I agree with, uh, very liberal Democrats, progressive Democrats, right? For the most part, I'm a libertarian. Stay the fuck out of my way. Let me do my thing. Don't don't let don't have the government tell me what to do. Um, but I see the value in some of the positions on all sides, right? So I try not to be so dogmatic in my approach, where you know I can't see something from a given perspective, right? So libertarians, let's let's talk about. Well, not libertarianism, but very close to it is is Austrian economics. And what Austrian economics economists like to do is go to deserted islands. So let's go to a deserted island. <clears throat> and there is a little economy in that deserted island. And then you have to provide some value to other people to exchange uh, for for money, right? Now Let's say this deserted island is this world, this reality. What can other people trade with you? Yeah, so I can only go so far in what I do, right? So I do have things that I'm not great at yet. Uh, ideally, so, so for right now, I have to go food shopping. I can't grow my own food, right? So I have to be able to offer enough value to the world that I have money to pay for food, right? So technically, that's the value that someone could offer. So even if I've got enough land to grow the majority of my own food, 
it doesn't cover all the bases, right? I'm not fish. I don't have the time to fish. The value I offer, I hope that would be enough where I could trade for fish, fatty fish, sardines, salmon, whatever it may be. So for now, I guess the value would be food that I can't grow on my own. Uh, but, you know, being as self-sufficient as possible, you know, when you hear unplug from the matrix, I think being as self-sufficient as possible is one aspect of that. It's not just the, the system wants you to believe X, Y, or Z. It's, uh, do you have to go to the store to get your food? You know, you know, could you survive? I mean, granted, I would need something like Starlink, you know, to, to have internet and connect, connect to society. Right. So there's a few people that are building these tools that I would need to rely upon, but I wouldn't need the government for internet or other internet companies, you know, trying to rely as much on, on myself as possible as a part of this thing. But I, I would need some things like certain foods, you know, and hope that what I can offer, I could get back. Right. You see, I tried to go way too abstract with this uh, question, but uh, what I wanted to ask you is that this, this is the time in the show for call to action for a, uh, for for an advertisement. So, do you have a product right now that um, you're you're selling? That your value that you're providing to other people that it's such a big value that they are even willing to give you money for it. Sure. Yeah. So the obvious is I have t-shirts in any color, or red, blue. I don't know, uh, red, white, and blue. Uh, not for any reason. It's just the colors. Uh, yeah. There are plenty of ways to support me and what I'm doing. Um, besides t-shirts, uh, watching YouTube, watching YouTube videos, I have a Patreon where I have various tiers. People can check out. I post my daily data for, uh, fitness metrics. I post my daily diet, post, uh, early videos. These are all separate tiers. I post correlations with the data. It's another tier. I offer one-on-one -on -one consults. So there are many ways that people can support me and I can offer value back. So that's probably the best way is Patreon and, and uh, T-shirts. There are also affiliate links that are on those sites too. So people are blood testing, whether it's True Diagnostic or NAD or any blood test in general, if they use discount links that are under the YouTube videos that help support what I do. And then there's ways to donate. You know, uh, I've got things like buy me a coffee. I've got, uh, I also wrote a book in 2016 that people could check out, but that's on a slightly different topic, microbial burden and, and what we can do to fight back. So yeah, those are the ways to support. Michael Lasgarden, conquer aging or die trying, fellow freedom lover. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Adam.